I love the way she says that. <laughs> it's so polite and kind. Um, good afternoon, good morning, uh, and perhaps good evening if you're watching this on a recording. Uh, and welcome to our uh, December leadership listening for USITT. I'm David Grindle, your executive director, and being joined today by our secretary, Paul Bruner, and President Carolyn Satter. Um, just to give you a general update of things in the Institute. Um, today starts our eighth year of doing LINK, the uh, graduate school interview weekend uh, with, that we do in partnership with SETC that kicked off this morning. Uh, this is our second year of doing it online uh, after polling the various participants from last year and the schools, they actually thought it worked really well. Um, and it's, it's incredible. It, it's, we have 61 graduate programs uh, interviewing 129 candidates. Wow. Um, so that, that partnership continues to work really, really well between us and SCTC. Um, and so I, I'm very pleased and excited uh, to see how that's, that's rolling along. Um, and from USITT's land, those of you who've worked with uh, Liz here in our office, no one's going to be shocked or surprised when I tell you that uh, it is running smoother than the German train system. Uh, in the days when we counted on the German train system running smoothly. Um, Liz is just, has been stunning with that project. Um, and so it is up and on its feet today. To date, over the eight years, we have paired up more than 600 uh, candidates with graduate programs, uh, which is really kind of astonishing. Sandy? Uh, uh, congratulations. The, those figures are terrific. Can you listen to me? Yes, I'm trying to make my phone quit yelling at me. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm just curious if there are any international schools participating in the program. This year, there are not. We've had inquiry from some of the schools, uh, but the, the, the recruitment time is off for mm. them and us, and so it's not as good of a pair. Um, but we do keep reaching out to them uh, and letting them know it's an option, especially since we're in the virtual world. Mm -hmm. But that's when, when the feedback we've gotten is that it just wasn't a good recruiting time for them. When, when would they be recruiting? More into the spring when they're typically at our show. Oh, okay, okay. <clears throat> Thank Pat, you. You're welcome. Um, I'm just curious. Yeah, congratulations. I just got off of a call in, in which a, a, a lighting designer who's responsible for recruiting graduate students mm -hmm. said, when is the USITT doing this thing? I said, I think it's starting right about now. So my only, I realize it's not your responsibility to take their hands and make them write it in their date books. But uh, how did how does a, a well-known lighting designer with a, a school, a university in California not know that she should be there right now? I, I know you, you don't know. Okay. <laughs> I agree with you. I do not know how they do not know because every, I, I will tell you the, the biggest challenge and we see this just across all of our stuff right now. And, and we've always had this problem in schools um, it's worse now across the board with all of our, our organizational uh, members is with people coming and going, uh, all the various contacts we have, some, at some schools, we have no idea they're no longer there. Uh, so that could be one of the options. And the other one is it could have just been completely ignored. I, I, I'm not sure because for based on what you're saying there, Pat, the assumption is this school is an active USITT kind of, yeah. Totally I mean, true, totally true and, and participates in IRTA and everything else. So it's sort of like, 
<clears throat> they were wondering when they were going to be contacted. Yeah, never mind. I'll take care of that offline with you. <laughs> Brilliant, because I do want to know more. Oh, Lord. Um, so we are, um, I know I've been working with, with Sandy and Pat some uh, to get more of the conference schedule being posted uh, coming up. Uh, we're starting to be able to release uh, some of the session information this week. We hope to have more of the conference schedule finalized so that people can see that coming up in the next couple of weeks, uh, getting things in. We frankly are dealing with a lot of uh, come and go in sessions. Uh, sessions suddenly will, where we had people who, yes, we can do this. Now, no, I can no longer travel or I got a show. And certainly more than any time ever, the phrase I got a show to do, we want hmm. people doing shows. Yeah. Um, so that's been what a lot of our common delay has been in this, in getting it out there. Um, but uh, Mark, I know we were in a meeting uh, today and we're working on being able to at least get some of the uh, sessions that are confirmed out so that people know the names and the ideas of things. Um, and since the vast majority of you on this call are our current or soon to be fellows, uh, I will let you know that the fellows meeting will be scheduled for Friday. So Sandy, I'm scheduling your lunch for Thursday so that that can be settled, both of which at noon. Um, <clears throat> so that that is on the, the books. Um, and if that having that information helps, uh, your lunch will be Thursday at noon. Yes, the, Pat. The other question is what happened to, or are we, did we give it up or is it gonna come back? Um, the international reception, which was a fellows and international event because that was when we have our student ambassadors needing to be there to, to meet their uh, guests. That one, I'm still working on uh, putting it into its final schedule slot. So it will be there. I just don't have the answer yet as to which of the two venues it's going to be in. Oh, I don't care about the venue. I only care about the date. Okay, I can probably have a date to you by the end of the week. Would it be, I mean, it's like, we used to do it at the beginning of the conference, like it might've been the night before the show floor opened, but because those are simultaneous now, I don't know. Um, yeah, it, I, I need to have a conversation with Casey because I think I know when it's supposed to be, but I want to confirm with, with her. Well, I, sure I, reached out to Casey, I reached out to Casey last week and she never responded or maybe it was two weeks ago, Okay, with, which means that there's something wrong with um, emails and other people who answers who don't have access to base camp. Okay. So that is, for the moment, the information I have for you on the process of things. Today, I can tell you that, that while our world is topsy-turvy and nothing ever operates the way it's supposed to, we've processed over 200 conference registrations in the last 24 hours because today's a deadline. Um, which means that some things, no matter what changes in the world, our people's ability to go skidding into a deadline on two wheels is still safe and unaffected by any <laughs> pandemic anywhere. I feel personally called out <laughs> in this conversation right now. I feel like I have been attacked for registering about 12 hours ago. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Here's the thing. You're, You're early, way day. ahead of the curve for most people. <laughs> I got to tell you, though, between getting the very well-crafted email about how to use my money from the prior conference to then actually signing up for the conference was too far apart. And so I was like, why won't my promo code work? I don't understand. I didn't follow the instructions that I was emailed multiple times. <laughs> Um, I, I, I will uh, also say to you, because many of you have been through this uh, before, 
I, I'm, I'm honestly um, shocked at how little of that we have seen redeemed from individual members compared to people with new dollars. And, and we're on top of it. We're trying to make sure that we don't take money from people we've already taken money from. Um, so. David, um, how, how's our booth space looking? Booth space is looking not too bad. We are currently, one moment, I will bring you up to the date numbers. Um, we've sold about half the floor space in square footage. Um, we are just now, uh, starting to really turn, um, get a return on tables from schools because a lot of schools have, have held out on marketing, uh, money and travel money until the first of the year. Um, so I, I honestly think we'll probably drop where before we were at about 300 exhibitors, I think in, in reality. Uh, I think we will be in probably the 225 because um, we've had several of our companies say they, uh, and we have a few that are no longer in business. We have some that have said we're not doing trade shows yet. Um, I think we'll do uh, a little better um, as long as things stay mostly okay. Uh, uh, mutations wise. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think we're, we're at the mercy of, uh, of all of this. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that is, that's probably one of our biggest challenges. We're looking, um, I will also say, you know, we have posted the the policy on vaccines or recovered within the last 90 days, uh, things like that. Um, looking at how we're managing that um, and uh, verifying that information, things like that, there, there's a whole new industry of companies that are managing that for events now. Yeah. Uh, and so we're having to look into that um, because I, I spoke with another association, they were like, no, we're just telling people to put their vaccine card in the back of their, uh, their badge. I was like, oh, no, no, I don't know. People will lose it. And then I got people's vaccine cards laying around. No. Um, so, um, you know, welcome to the new world of things I never dreamed we would be dealing with right um so paul would you like to give a follow-up uh for anyone who wasn't in the board meeting um i can yeah i'm trying to think i don't have the some of my notes with me i'm on the road for work right now and i'm in a lobby at my uh employer so hopefully it's not too noisy in the background um, when was our meeting on the 11th of November? Yes. And i um, trying to think through what specific things we went through. The thing I'll, I guess I can specifically speak to is um, we just had a first reading of some recommended uh, amendments to the bylaws. Um, so the board, uh, we walked through that in pretty good detail and the board reviewed that. Uh, and then the following Monday uh, after the bylaw, after the uh, board meeting, we uh, launched a sort of a members review portal online so that members of the Institute can um, provide comments and feedback on any of those proposed changes, um, which uh, I am monitoring because they come directly to me. So um, we also had a conversation about a, the board discussed a, a COVID policy for the conference. And um, I don't know if David, if maybe you can fill in the details of that, but uh, if I remember correctly, we followed and adopted the what is essentially is the CDC guidelines for someone who wants to enter the United States. What are those guidelines? 
Uh, we looked at that pretty carefully and made, I think, a minor adjustment to that. And that's become our um, set of recommendations going forward in terms of requiring vaccines and or testing procedures for the conference. And in terms of mask usage and or requirements, we are essentially, if I, this too is a little sketchy, I believe we decided to hold off and wait and see what the city of Baltimore puts in place uh, a few weeks before the conference and, and see where things are going at that time and make, make some choices closer to the conference since, as we all know, this is quite a fluid situation. So. Sure, do you want me to, to read what that policy was? That was yeah, if you could, yeah, I think that'd be good. Sure, um, so the, the, the shift the board made uh, from the CDC, the CDC uses a lot of ands, uh, the board is using ors. Um, so proof of full vaccination uh, as defined by the CDC, which is two doses, uh, boosters are not required, but as always recommended. Um, or if you are unvaccinated or not fully vaccinated, a negative COVID-19 test within three days of the event. Or if you are recently recovered, you may instead show documentation of recovery and a negative test three days before the event. Um, that's the next step is figuring out how we have that uploaded and verified. And we're working uh, with companies to, to handle that so that we're not getting all up in various people's medical records. Um, so that is uh, the policy there. And as far as masks go, we are beholden to the policy of uh, when it comes to mask, whatever the city of Baltimore Health Department has is what we will be following at that time. At this point, Baltimore has an indoor mask mandate uh, for uh, public or large events. And so assuming nothing changes, we will be a, a masked conference as well. Pat has a question. Uh, Paul, yep. uh, I'm curious about the, uh, the the member portal. Thank you very much for setting that up. <clears throat> Are you planning to have a, a, a town hall like this where people can ask questions instead of submit them to the portal? Uh, we don't have a separate town hall schedule. I think the uh, this type of meeting, either this one or the one that we would hold either here, the, I guess it would be the very beginning of January, would serve as that, that forum. It would seem that if that's what you, that it would be a good idea, but I leave this up to you guys to create an agenda and publish it so that people know that this is where they can come to ask these questions. <clears throat> because I, th I know I have some questions about the intent of the plan uh, and I don't know whether this is the right time to bring them up or not, or do I just want to do, et cetera. I just, just asking. Yeah, well, I, I don't know what else we have on the agenda for this meeting today. I don't. Uh, this we, is all for you and Carolyn at this point. Okay. Because I think, I think this is a perfect time. If you have some questions you want to raise right now, that'd be fine. Um, and we can talk about them and, yeah. So this is not necessarily, my first question is not necessarily specific to the bylaws, but I see, I see uh, what, what I'm having difficulty with. Can somebody explain to me the difference between a committee of the board, a committee of the corporation, and a commission? And some things that we have called committees should they be re reclassified as commissions? Well, that's a question. I can I can answer some of that very clearly and some of it not so clearly. Um, but 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 this is the kind of thing that maybe maybe if you could you mm -hmm. these are questions you can clarify later because if I have this question, I'm sure I'm not the only person who's wondering. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, committee a committee of the board is. Um, a committee uh, that is only composed of members of the board of directors. Got it. And a committee of the corporation can include board, board members, staff members, volunteers, um, and any other sort of right. other composition of members. Um, right. So, and yeah. I do remember you saying that. 
Yeah, yeah. Yep. And it's David. Just one other big distinction. Because a committee of the board is made up only of board members, they can make binding decisions that a committee of the corporation cannot make. Mm -hmm. yep. And I'll add to that, that was, um, I think, frankly, a, a concern of members of the bylaws committee when we learned about this, because, for example, if we sort of followed the letter of the law of the New York State, it would tell us that, you know, if we had the finance committee defined as a as a committee of the board, it could only include uh, members who are board members. And that's not been USITT's practice. We've always had at large members and sort of put together the best group of people we felt for that particular committee. So we worked with the uh, uh, count, you know, legal counsel to sort of discuss what that looks like. And he said, as long as we don't call them members of the committee, we can have um, what I'd refer to as advisory persons uh, who basically participate in that committee, but they're not actually informed or excuse me, involved in the decision-making of that committee. Yeah, I think I think that that's a really important distinction that a lot of us would yep. like to have on uh, uh, further clarified. But I, I don't want to get off of and a commission because I got yep. I have a thing about commissions. Some com some committees need to be commissions, I think. <laughs> well, a commissions uh, that is the one that's a little harder to define. Uh, our bylaws have a. Um, uh, some information about that and frankly we've been working pretty closely with the uh, current VP commissions uh, Ashley and some of the leadership of the commissions to discuss that and uh, quite frankly uh, ask them to sort of discuss who they think they are as commissions what do they think their role their role is in USITT and maybe how has that changed over time and do they see that being coming something different in the future um, because there too you're right it is a different thing they're not just a committee um, it, they're uh, what we have sort of referred to as a subject matter affinity group is, is sort of the way I like to think of them, almost as a guild of sorts within the Institute. Um, and we have a pretty simple process of creating more commissions, but in terms of function, our intent is to basically treat commissions as though they are a special category of committee of the corporation. So they have that kind of function. They have a direct line to the board um, in terms of bringing motions to the board and things like that. So, so this is going way back into history, but it, there's, there's always been a little lack of clarity in my mind about this. <clears throat> and maybe Sandy knows is something, but why is international not a commission? You know, that's what I was gonna ask David. <laughs> Why is it a committee and not a commission? Has it ever been no. suggested? Because we, when, we, when we created digital media, we set up protocol. So the protocol is set up there for a group to become a commission. But if it's never surfaced, the request has never surfaced. Well, Okay, so I'm a, I'm gonna come come in on this one with with my own history and leadership here, uh, which is the request hasn't surfaced since that structure went into place, but also let's make it further murky by pointing out that international is also treated as a quasi kind of sort of commission sometimes when we feel like it and that committee sometimes when we feel like it. And it's kind of like stage managers in equity. Sometimes we're in equity and sometimes we're management. And so I, I'm going to vote with two hands, all in favor of somebody just coming up with a good rational decision on what to do there. Because I, I laugh because I'm right there with you. Well, it's, it's one of those things where I go, well, why, why is international doing this when you don't have to do this if you're over here in digital media, et cetera? Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that is something we, the members, could bring to the fore, but do we have to get the approval of the committee to do it? Because now we come to my favorite pro problem, which is term limits. 
as long as term limits exist without a way to get back into the structure, everybody who cares about, we we'll use international because that's the one I'm, we, we can't get back into the executive leadership. Has anybody talked to the international committee about this? Well, it's the yes. Institute's term limits policy that does this. Again, I'm going back to, has anybody talked to the international committee to see if this is something they are looking to pursue. We haven't talked about this particular issue in terms of commission versus committee. Okay. Um, but what we have talked about is the term limits. And um, we pretty much have been stalled on that conversation. Um, but in the meantime, there, there are people who have been asked to leave the International Committee who have tried every year to get back on and have not been able to, to do that. And Paul, this term limit thing we brought up to you about three years ago, and you, mm -hmm. rec you recognized that it was inconsistent, but we need to yep. change. We, I think we as an organization need to make some decisions about whether you really only want someone to spend six years being involved in digital media before you kick them out and never let them back in. Right. Well, and, and the, the term limit, look, a couple of things. I mean, the term limits don't behave that way. I mean, all they do is, is, um, is limits to six years, I believe, continuous years of service on a committee, on a board, um, and in commission leadership. Um, if there's something else going on, that that's, that's there is no stipulation about how long you have to be off before you can get right. back on. One right. year is all it is. Well, it doesn't say that anywhere, and the right. international committee does not operate that way. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And it needs to be clarified. I mean, because you're lo my feeling, and I think I'm joined by a number of other people who really seriously care about the Institute. We are a little possessive about our roles and our history with it. I mean, sure, we need lots of new faces, but how about those of us who still have things we want to do for the Institute? There's no avenue for us to do that anymore. What do you, what would some of the benefits be of international becoming a commission? What do we see as the distinction or the benefit to do it? That's exactly why I asked you what was a commission and what was a committee. Yeah, because I've heard the question several times, but I don't really know what the sort of suggestion or argument is. Sandy. Sandy. Uh, I think the structure that would uh, be, um, it would evolve as a commission is that you would have leadership and then anybody who is interested in that area can be involved with it. Um, whereas a committee, the membership seems to be much smaller and we've lost that sense of an international interest group um, in the same way that you would have a costume interest group um, for the costume commission. Um, what I noticed is that it does say in, in the current bylaws, the, the part that's written about committees has not changed at all. And it does say that there's a six year term limit on the, um, uh, the leadership um, consecutive um, and doesn't say if they go off when they can come back on. Um, I think it's in the policies and procedures where it says that you can only have a six year membership on this committee. And I think perhaps if it were a commission, we might be able to open that up a little bit, or maybe we rewrite the policy and procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and I put a note on down here about sort of, if international explores becoming a commission, it sort of almost becomes an open forum in, in ways that it that it currently isn't. And like you said, people right. can sort of walk into the room and, and, and become part of the conversation. Which I think is right what now. we all want because mm -hmm. we, we don't want, we wouldn't like to continue the top down situation that has and very restricted situation that has uh, grown up mm -hmm. in recent years. Mm -hmm. It used to be anybody and everybody who wants to spend money to go someplace is welcome, but that has changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. 
Um, along these same lines, um, oh, shoot, I'm getting a lot of glare on my screen. I need to turn around. I had to go outside to get uh, better I sound. I hate that yeah, you have to be outside better. like that, Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> well, I better, it, well, and a sunny day in Oregon? What is this? I, I'm not sure uh, where that came from. Um, I noticed that the section about committees has not been rewritten, and yet we've made a huge change in the structure of these committees with the elimination of the vice presidential positions. And so it seems to me that there are issues that come up by not having those positions that have an influence on the committee, be it a conference committee or international committee. And so I'm, um, you know, at this point, the head of the committee is still um, vetted by nominations and approved by the president and the board. And the members don't have a chance to vote in the way that they did when that position was a vice presidential position. And so I'm just thinking that the structure and the process of a committee as written in the bylaws needs to be re-examined because of this change. Well, there's, at, under our current bylaws, I think there's only one or two committee chair positions that are assigned by virtue of an office. And those happen to be the ones that I sit on, chair bylaws, chair of nominations. Every other chair that I'm aware of in the Institute um, is assigned um, and approved by the board and are not virtue of an office. So for example, the vice president for, I don't think the vice president for conferences, for example, is by virtue of office chair of conferences committee even though it tends to be the case. Um, and that chain was made some years ago uh, just to open up that flexibility um, and have more ability to make alterations moving forward. Deb. And I can give a sort of more recent example of that. Um, Ellen Marie and I served as co-chairs of the membership committee, which is traditionally the VP of member sections and chapters. But for three years, we chaired that committee with the VP on the committee. So it's, um, in recent years, there's an example that um, we have not done a traditional VP is the chair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when I was VP for international, it was the very first time and I ended up being chair of the committee as well because I didn't know any better. Um, and uh, so there the two things were linked and um, it, it just, it seems to me that the members of the committee should have a voice in selecting who the chair is, especially in these cases where the committee chair seems to have been elevated um, uh, with the absence of the vice president. Yeah, and that's a good point that, it, that you brought up that, uh, with, as you say, with the absence of VPs, it does elevate the chair positions on many of these right. committees, and, and I think in a really positive way. Um, and I think what we don't have yet it is all the nuts and bolts figured out from the nominations committee point of view about how they plan to review um, and uh, uh, evaluate, you know, mm -hmm. potential chairs to positions. That's something they need to get their teeth into here very soon, which I'll be working with them on. Um, but it's something that, you know, they already sort of review candidates for the board and it's a, a logical role for them to play. Ultimately, they're gonna be making recommendations to the board uh, for approval and not making the final selections. But um, anyway, I think you bring up a good point. Um, thank you. Uh, just to flip back to committees versus commissions, mm -hmm. how do you become the head of a commission? Is it from the membership of the commission? That is a good question too. Um, every commission sort of has a different way of going about doing that. Um, We're trying to unify that structure yeah. as well because there are currently 11 structures for the way that happens. Right. So you hear where I'm going. If, the, mm -hmm. if international was a commission, then anybody who was interested in belonging to that commission could run for the position if there was one. Right. Shouldn't mm -hmm. all commissions have the same sort of like executive structure? That's the only way you can deal with, that's the only way you can deal with term limits. In theory, Pat, yes. In practice, there are little differences amongst them that are, we're trying to sort out. But yeah. yes. 
and and uh, you know also in the sort of spirit of trying to move a bit away from this top down sort of perspective that a lot of people have about the institute yeah. right now, really trying to encourage commissions to sort of self determine what what they want that to look like. Are they going to elect their their commission leadership? Some do that right now. Some don't. Some are just sort of appointed. Um, some pick the short straw and end up getting stuck with it for three years. You know, there's a lot of different ways that sort of, it sort of gets put together. And um, so as David said, there's, that's in the works now and it's kind of a slow process to kind of better understand how each of the commissions do things and how they want to unify that approach. How does the membership have input into that process? Into the... I, I'm sorry, please define that. The, stru the structuring of all that stuff. Of all the commissions? Commissions or, or how you're going to run all that. How do we oh, know that that's leadership. being discussed? How do we know that's being discussed? And how do we express our opinions about it? From the commission standpoint, it's being discussed. Uh, let me rephrase this. From the commission standpoint, it's been asked to be discussed in the commission meetings. Right. That part I can tell you. Just an observation. I've always thought it was odd that um, in the costume commission, we vote on which sessions we would like to have at the next conference, but we've never voted on our leadership. Um, really? And so I, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, I really, I appreciate that we get to vote on the sessions and, and just wonder why uh, we don't have that access. It's quite possible it would be the same thing as what we find with USITT voting that there often isn't more than one person. Um, and there does seem to be a, a pretty open and visible pathway to leadership within the commission. Um, but nonetheless, that, that's the way that that works. Um, uh, if I could ask another question, um, there is a list of um, committees of the board in the bylaws, but there is not a list of committees of the corporation there. Um, so what, why is that missing, please? Um, because the bylaws do not define committees of the corporation, they're defined by the board themselves. So that can, it allows therefore the ability to create new committees through um, sunset committees over time in a much more fluid way um, yeah. versus having you know, what we used to basically think of as a standing versus ad hoc, um, that, that was kind of a fixed structure. So it gives more flexibility over time is the short answer. Right, and, and I, I think that they are listed in the policies and procedures. Yeah, and that's where they will, that's where they will reside. And right now bylaws is going through and, and reviewing that pretty carefully um, in response to the anticipated approval of the new bylaws uh, to start putting some of these policies in place um, and reformatting them so that they better conform to, you know, the process moving forward, so. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. You know, make sure we don't miss the comment over in the chat there. Tina mentioned that every commission has a slightly different structure because they are different size and complexities. And that's a good point. Um, you know, the engineering being a very small but mighty uh, commission has <laughs> often, you know, a very different approach than some of the larger uh, commissions. So thanks, Tina. I don't think we are looking for one, a cookie cutter for all of the 11 commissions because of their diversity and because of their, uh, again, the size. Uh, I think the difference between, again, engineering and costuming or scene design who have so many other um, other components to the to the makeup of the uh, basic commission. Uh, but there's ne there does need to be, and there has been asked for some consistency where it is doable. Uh, Dick Devon is, is, is putting things in chat. Why don't you just unmute Dick and talk to us? We're watching your fingers move. <laughs> yes, he's very busy. Commissioners have been appointed by the VP and or president. Oh, <laughs> oh okay. Oh. All right. <laughs> okay. Sorry, we know this is a technology group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, I feel that every day. Um, yeah, that's 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 currently the practice where uh, every year the board reviews a list of commissioners and or it kind of provides a reappointment on an annual basis for the commissioners. And then it's what we're now calling associate commissioners and vice commissioners are all appointed by their various um, uh, various uh, commissions themselves. Well, wait, that sounds like a very important piece of information. Mm -hmm. Associate and vice? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's part of what we've got to, to rein right. in. Mm -hmm. is that in some of these structures, we had commissions creating titles and positions. And that's all part of what Ashley and, and group are working to try to make consistent. Because what does that mean? It means different things yep. in different spaces. And we've got to get back to a consistent meaning of things. Yeah, we had terminology like uh, senior commissioner and junior commissioner and vice commissioner and project leader and, and a lot of different things that, um, you know, from from an outside perspective, kind of don't make a lot of sense, uh, let alone from an impact inside perspective where they really need to make sense. I think over the years, they have kind of built their own hierarchy and their own uh, ascension plan and uh, without Without, and I know in my six years as VP of commissions, uh, we weren't going down that path of pushing them past. And so I think now it's a matter of saying, okay, let's just, let's just stop for a minute and take a look and see what these all mean. Because again, to the membership, I would think it'd be extremely confusing to put up an org chart, or not an org chart, but a list of each of the uh, leadership positions for each commission and go, what, <laughs> what the heck is this? So uh, well, I totally agree with you and I'd be happy to go. Oh, no, I'm not going to say that. No, please do not do that to <laughs> <I> yourself. Mean, <laughs> but I would hope that this starts internally within the commissions. And I, I, I get, I have not had a, I had a chance to talk to Ashley in a bit, but that this starts with her and the commissions to figure out what they look like and then bring it forward rather than an outside source trying to figure it out for them. And I, I really believe in that. I can tell you. Oh. <laughs> For my uh, Dick, Dick Devin put in the comments, please see my question as submitted on this session form. I didn't know there was one, but is anybody looking at them? Are you talking about the bylaws form, Dick? I'm trying to ask yes, no questions so I can get to a head nod. <laughs> in the meantime, I'll say that the, nobody is ever going to catch up with the costume commission in terms of number of <laughs> positions. <laughs> Agreed, I think you're probably right. I think you're probably right. Sandy. We get stuff done. Yes, yes, yep. you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> The one that's attached to this session. <laughs> I wonder if it's not the bylaws comment. No, I think he's referring to the fact that when we signed up for the session, there was a box in there where you could submit questions, which oh. some of us did. Oh, hold on. Smarter than you knew. <laughs> Ah, somebody do a song and dance number while I'm still working on this, please. Um, Tina has her hand raised. Tina? Yeah, so just in the meantime, just, you know, to song and dance, I'll just say that uh, I became the management commissioner because I was having a glass of wine with David Stewart as an EDI meeting, and he said, hey, I'm going to step aside as the commissioner, and I want you to take over. I was a vice commissioner at the time. So now we are certainly a smaller commission than costumes, but, you know, who isn't? Um, but anyway, my understanding is there, there tends to be um, – 
there is a succession plan from the, you know, put into motion by the commissioner, it is obviously okayed and, uh, you know, approved by lots of people up the chain. So anyway, that's, that's certainly how management works. And as somebody who is coming to the end of six years, I guess I should think about that. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> And I agree with I agree with Dick. I mean, that's David Will passed it over to me. Um, and and on Mark. commissions, you just don't have readily candidates surfacing who have some experience in the commission work. Files, yeah. notes, attachments, bridge. Then why are committee chairs treated differently? Committee chairs are appointed by nominations and the president and the board, whereas commissions can self-govern. Well, as for, for year one of my term early on, uh, I was asked to position board members on certain committees. And that's all I did was assign board members to certain committees. That, yeah, that used to be part of the responsibility of being a board member that you needed to serve on committee. Correct. Yeah. Um, but I, again, this, you know, as the bylaws changes started, so much of this, uh, Sandy, is in flux. Um, and so much of this, I think we do not have the answers to, but we are aggressively, Search Paul is leading the team that uh, meets every week at this point. Uh, to try to vet some of this out. So it's, Wait a minute. A lot of this is a work in process with answers that are that are not conclusive yet. Thank you. I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you and the chat both. <laughs> oh. David, did you find it? Yeah, I found something. I'm sending it to Dick to make sure that I'm asking the right question for everyone else that, okay, cool. I'm seeing a head nod. And, so, and, Deb, sure, and Deb is raising her hand. Deb. Hey, um, well, I think that uh, I, <laughs> I disagree sometimes with uh, the baton passing uh, in commissions um, as uh, the youngest member on the board. Um, let me tell you, there are some 30 and 40 year olds who still have no idea how to get involved in commissions. They go to the meetings, they send emails, they can't get to the VP, so they can't get to the commissioner. So it's like the the getting in to leadership is, is elusive to them, much less getting to be the leader one day is elusive to them. So if we're going to pass the baton, we need a bigger circle <laughs> and a more inclusive circle and a way to get into the circle. Um, I, I didn't know in a decade of, of being involved in USITT, I didn't know that some commissions voted until this year. I learned that at the board meeting in August and I went, well, that's interesting. Um, and that has its own um, cool kids club when you vote, people know you kind of a connotation. But if there's, a, if there's an actual ladder that everyone has access to and can climb. Um, that is better than passing the baton. Um, uh, we have, I mean, we have great leaders in management, um, but it, it's, I don't know what to tell the 20 year olds what they need to do now to be ready to be 30 year olds in the commission, to be 40 year olds. In the, and then all of a sudden we've got people with 30 years of experience who have no idea how to get involved in leadership. Um, so there's, it's whatever sort of path we end on, if it's everyone votes or, or pass the baton or some version of both, um, there's definitely um, people in all commissions, people just come up and talk to me um, about, you know, how do they, how do they move up? Um, they're raising their hands, they're sending the emails, but they, the, the leadership aspect is still elusive to them. So in these conversations with Ashley and, and as the commissions and the committees morph, um, certainly the entrance point has to be something we have to, to figure out or we're just gonna lose really invested people. And that's not just applying to the young. Oh gosh, no. Oh gosh, no. <laughs> but I, I mean, uh, because I'm under the age of 40, those are the people who talk to me. <laughs> yeah. So I have a lot more of that perspective to give, and I don't want to speak on behalf of people who haven't told me something. 
I just, I just want to interject that, um, and Carolyn knows this because she was VP at the time, but some years ago, I actually wrote up a proposal for a kind of commission mentorship program, and it obviously needed a different title, but that was the idea. I understand why it didn't go anywhere with the Institute, but um, I think the idea is still good, and I actually know some commissions that have uh have a kind of um, mentorship thing. I mean, I I pretty much have done it by kind of doubling the amount of these season management since I've been the commissioner. So we all do it in different ways, right? Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's an idea that I kind of keep coming back to as having potential. Okay, Paul. I am muted, yes. Um, so I'll, I'll read the question here. I'll read it. So David, you posted it in the chat directly to me. So, um, and I think, is this the one that's from? Yes, that's the one that's from Dick. That All right. I, I just want to... <laughs> Since many of the proposed bylaws changes appear to be based on recommended practices rather than changes in new or previously existing New York law, would it not be a good idea to get a second uh, not-for-profit expert legal opinion on the need for changes of practices that have been in place and working well for decades before making monumental changes, example being the elimination of vice president positions. Um, I think, I mean, I, I think we could explore that um, and see if, the, if a second opinion is worth doing at this point, we're pretty far down the pathway, which is one thing to bring up. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll sort of point out without sharing too much right now, um, we've had, we haven't, you know, some things have not been working very well lately. Um, and that's, that's part of what has brought up this conversation to begin with was some, I would describe it as some dysfunction that was occurring um, and, and sort of set across purposes between some of our elected VP positions versus our staff members, uh, even versus some commissioners. Um, due to a lack of uh, what I would describe as a lack of clarity on some of the position descriptions, what the job descriptions are, or position descriptions are, what the response lines of responsibilities are um, over time. And things have changed. For example, we have a much larger, I mean, what, I guess one of the biggest examples is we have a much larger staff in the national office now than we did 10 or 12 years ago. And there hasn't been a, a, um, response to that in our bylaws or in our policies um, where we are we have you know hired professionals to do a series of things within our institute that have largely been uh, assigned to them that used to be the role of a lot of our VPs and um, now that we have professionalized a lot of those activities rather than being elected positions um, that's where a lot of the shift is kind of coming about so We did have multiple people with, oh, okay, that's David giving me another comment. Yeah, we had quite a few people give us a lot of uh, um, comments on, on the, the recommendations that we put together. So it's not, not as though just a few of us are sitting in a room and thought about this. We had ultimately three different lawyers from that law, legal firm who took a look at our bylaws and, and made some recommendations and met with us over the course of the summer. Uh, in addition to providing the board with some training uh, at the August retreat. Um, and we looked at a lot of different professional resources that are currently out there in terms of what are the practices of highly effective boards. And, you know, they really all point in the same direction, uh, which is the direction we're going towards. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in, a sec mm -hmm. in the land of second opinions, uh, a number of us have talked with other nonprofit lawyers who specialize in New York. Uh, nonprofit law who go news to me you don't have to do it that way what are some examples of that i couldn't be specific right now but it almost everything that is quote legal is only a recommended practice and when the recommended practice gets in the way of the way we want to function then we should think about whether it's a good idea to change or not sure sure yeah. sandy how do we describe and define in a membership driven organization how to divide responsibilities between staff and members 
so that members are still in charge of the things that they want and need to be in charge of. How, how have you been able to shape that conversation, please? That's, that's a good question. Um, th that is largely um, related to what we talked about earlier about kind of the elevation of, of the role of com committee chairs. I mean, that's exactly where volunteers reside and is maybe one of, um, again, an elevated uh, ability, or excuse me, an elevated leadership position um, versus what it sort of has looked like in the past. Um, so it gives our leader, our members, our valued members, um, the ability to lead in ways uh, maybe they haven't before in a more engaged way. Um, and hopefully make a more clear entry point for them. As, as Deb was kind of talking about earlier, the very, very foggy world of what is the entry point to leadership, to the commissions, to the committees, to, um, to the board and those things. And I think that's um, something that we need to fix within our USITT culture. And I hope that the nominations committee can come up with some ideas on how to do that too moving forward. What are some of the... Um jobs that members used to do that have been moved to the office then? Contracts. Got it. I think that's that's suitable. Um, the, the big one there, there's contracts. Um, and then uh, the other thing that has moved around is um, keeping communication flowing out to speakers for the mm. conference so that we get a, a consistent message going out to them. Things like that are what are moving about. Then there, there are other things, uh, Sandy, there's some content creation has been going through where the staff members, we're working with commissions or different groups um, to keep things moving, to create either online or please dear God soon again in person, mm -hmm. uh, events, keeping those things moving uh, through the contacts. A, a good example would be the digital media symposium that happened a couple of years ago. Uh, digital media, uh, people gave the contacts over, but it was staff that organized the event and got it moving uh, using the contacts of the commission. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're Sandy. welcome. Let, let me mention something, because I think in watching what happened when the COVID started, the office, and this, is, this has been a problem all the way along the way, um, the volunteers have a sometimes no limited time to as much time as they can to spend on a uh, conference project or a just a commission project, whereas the office staff, that is their job is to be able to move things forward. Um, I don't believe the online learning to what we see right now would have been as successful as it is right now had we not had people whose job it was to move it along. There were times when the word from commission was silent. They were crickets, uh, either because of whatever their own co professional commitments were or that. And I think it has been a proven track record that it takes the combination of the volunteers and the office staff working together to elevate us to where we are right now and where we stand in the industry, both uh, as to our virtual conference that appears from most outsiders an absolute success. But that was the office staff moving that along. There needs to be a respect for each other and a camaraderie and a working relationship that I have seen increase in order to make what USITT produces the best it can be. And I think if everybody works in that direction, um, however we can figure it out, I think we are going to be the best we can be. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you, Carolyn. I really appreciate hearing that. Um, and what is starting to come to mind is in the same way that we have defined committees of the board and committees of the corporation, I wonder if we can't define 
duties of the staff versus duties of the volunteers without, I know it could get really tricky, um, but just certainly contracts, spending money, um, making contacts outside the Institute. I think there are things that could be framed in such a way to make the, um, the distinctions clear. Yes, yeah, Sandy, I think a lot of that's gonna come as we work on the, the, the committees of the corporation and defining those. It gets mm -hmm. defined within that because there yeah, are a yeah. lot of spaces where as I try to get staff head around it, there are a lot of spaces where the committee decides A, B, and C. That's what drives us to be able to do the things we need to do. And then when we need to go back and we say, okay, I need these choices made again. So as to make sure that that relationship is going back and forth. Right. Yeah, if I could draw on experience that's more than 12 years old, how was I to know that individual members are even vice presidents? It's better if you don't directly contact stage expo vendors and ask favors of them, but rather that is something that should be funneled through the office. And so I think just good manners um, and, and kind of dividing up what what is office business and what is volunteer business would would um, would be a good start on this or a continuation. Agreed. Mm -hmm. the From editor, further down the coast. The editor in me begs us to consider the proper verbiage. The, the distinction that I hear happening is professional versus volunteer. Every volunteer is a professional. So let's be careful. We don't want the professionals that are paid to do the job to be looking down on the members who are volunteering and paying via their dues to hire those people. You hear where I'm going. Right. Um, I'm, I am <laughs> wanting to reduce silos. Yeah. Volunteer silos, member silos, office silos. To me, a project is a combination of the talents of both. And that is what I see as the future of this organization. Well, my dear colleagues, I, I will say that we are now uh, coming to the end of our hour that we had dedicated to the conversation. Um, I am hoping that when we come back, say that again. Oh, I am hoping uh, that that we can keep the conversation going because there are a lot of good things that came out of these ideas and comments and thoughts, and I appreciate that from everyone. Um, and I'm opening the chat just so I can get what Dick is going to share with us. Um, there we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I really do appreciate this. Um, I've sent a note uh, to, um, to Carolyn and Paul about uh, setting, um, uh, setting our January meeting. So we'll get that posted uh, so that it can be out there for folk. Um, and I'm hoping that Dana Taylor and I, if he is able to join us in the next round of this, uh, will be able to share some wonderfully exciting things that have been brewing uh, with uh, <laughs> growing out of, of ESET and the, uh, the backstage exam and our partnership with EDTA. That is really coming to a head. And so um, we're, we're, excited about what that may have to offer um, uh, as soon as we can sort out this very odd email that came through referencing dates and then referencing other dates about having meetings. It was just some typos that made it fun to try to figure out when we thought we were going to meet. Um, I do thank you all. Are there any further questions? Oh, I, want to, oh, I know. I, I should not have phrased it that way, Patricia. Shouldn't have. Never mind. I'm stopping. <laughs>
I want to thank everybody for for your time and your questions. They do not go. Um, they don't go in one ear and out the other. That's what I'm going to say to everybody. We, I am concerned about what you think and how we're going forward. So thank you. Um, and one last congratulations. I was not there, but I hear Carolyn did a beautiful job uh, representing the Institute, honoring the this year's Pat McKay Scholarship winners at LBI. Yep. And so while I have the presenter and the uh, person for whom such is named, I think we should all give thanks for that because yet again. Right, yeah. you know, I'll do it. Thank you. This is my engineer. That's his part. It was so, an honor. Thank you, Pat. I wished you would have been there. Uh, yeah, that's was like I wasn't going there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting that one out. <laughs> okay. Uh, they, recreated that they recreated the circle bar in the middle of the stage expo floor, which means nobody was masked. <laughs> uh, no, a lot of people were masked. Yep. Our but table everyone... was right there. Yep. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yep. Well, best wishes, everyone. Have wonderful holidays, uh, those of you who are celebrating now and those of you who are celebrating in the coming weeks. Um, so best wishes, everyone. And